All right, all right. Well, welcome to LifeBridge Church, everybody. We doing all right? Y'all can take a seat. It is so great to see you and to be here with you all this morning. Couple critical things to note as we jump in. Uh, number one, this is our last weekend in our collection called Essentials, moving through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, almost equally important, but maybe just slightly beneath that, is this is the last Sunday that we'll gather before we have college football kicking off, which is a beautiful thing. And so uh, on that note, I think it would just be appropriate to just quickly say, um, uh, Lord, we thank you for the Tennessee Volunteers. Um, <laughs> Father, we ask that Joe Milton's arm would be filled with both arm strength and accuracy. Lord, we ask that Alabama and Georgia would be wiped off the face of the map in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, uh, I would play for, or pray for Florida, but you know, I mean, just I just can't do it. So um, it, is, it is so great to see y'all. Uh, hey, we are uh, really excited to be continuing in this collection that we've been in. And, and let me say this, um, I have really thoroughly enjoyed moving through the Sermon on the Mount together uh, with you all. We've been in it since the week after Easter. So we've been in it for quite some time, and I just really believe in a thorough uh, walkthrough of the scriptures, that you don't skip over hard things, you don't skip over words, you don't skip over verses, but you move through it all together. And so that's what we're gonna continue to do this morning in a passage that's familiar, Matthew chapter seven, verse 24 through 29, that's where we're gonna be. I would ask this question as we uh, get into this text this morning, and that question is, is there anybody in here that is going through a storm of some kind that you would raise your hand and say, I'm going through a storm right now? A lot of us, okay. Well, Lord, we keep them in mind as we open up your word. And with that said, are y'all ready for the word? Yes. Matthew chapter seven, verse 24, the Lord says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded against that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. It says, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. Let's pray together. Uh, well, Lord, thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather in your house and to gather around your word. Father, I'm just so aware of the fact that there are many of us that are entering into a storm in the middle of a storm or just have found ourselves on the other side of one. And Father, maybe that doesn't resonate with some people in here. Maybe we've got some folks in here where everything is rainbows and butterflies and sunshine right now, and that's awesome. But the reality is that if we haven't encountered a storm in our life yet, we will. And we'll continue to. And Lord, today I ask that we would move through this text in a way that gives us a little bit more clarity and certainty on the way that we can navigate those well for your glory and for your honor. Father, I ask that our hearts would be fertile ground this morning for your word to not just be planted, but to take root in a way that's not just informational, it's transformational. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in 2005, Pam and Warren Adams had lost a home to Hurricane Rita, and so they knew that they were gonna have to rebuild. And so they decided that they were gonna end up rebuilding on the small island of Gilchrist, 
Texas. And if you don't know where Gilchrist, Texas is, it's on the Boulevard Peninsula, just inside of Galveston County near Houston. And they decided that they were gonna build their home on a plot of land that they found on Church Street. Now, uh, you can imagine that if you've lost your home to a hurricane, that's going to deeply impact the way that you're gonna build the next home, right? Like that's gonna influence the way that you end up going about your rebuild. And so one of the things that they wanted to do was have a little bit of a higher elevation as they built this. Now, uh, admittedly, Warren said, listen, we only found a plot of land that was about eight or nine feet above sea level, but that was eight or nine feet above sea level that was uh, a little bit more than everyone else had found in this area. Like most uh, of the land is very level with the sea. And so even to find just that little bit was substantial. And so uh, not only had they found uh, uh, elevation that had a little bit of a higher plot there, but they also decided to build their home on 16 foot pilings, which is slightly higher than it needed to be, but Warren wanted to catch a break on his flood insurance, so they made it just a little bit higher on this elevated ground that was already a little bit higher than everything else in the area. And so it didn't really matter, though, because in 2008, Hurricane Ike was brewing, and it was approaching steadily, and people were saying that this was going to be one of the most devastating storms that has ever hit the county. And so as a result of that, uh, the people knew that at some point they would likely need to evacuate. And what happened is that Warren walked out of his home at about midnight one evening, and he noticed that his wife was just standing there crying. And he said, honey, why are you crying? What's going on? And she said, there's water that's already coming up the side of the road, and they're saying that it's 24 hours from even making landfall. And so at 3.20 in the morning, they ended up evacuating the Boulevard Peninsula, and they ended up waiting with the rest of their neighbors to try to see when it is that they would be able to come back, but they just had to wait Hurricane Ike out. And as a result of it, uh, after Hurricane Ike had passed, they were finally allowed to start making their way back onto the peninsula. And as they did, they quickly realized that life was probably going to be a rebuild for the entire community because before they could even really get onto that peninsula, they could smell it because livestock had been killed and tossed all around the area and it was just dead and rotting. And as they pushed through that and they started to make their way onto some roads that they were a little bit more familiar with, what ended up happening is they realized there is nothing standing. There's nothing left standing here. And so they went down their streets and realized that everything is gonna be a rebuild until they got to Church Street and they realized that there was one home that was still standing. I think we have a photo of it. In this storm that was considered to be one of the most devastating storms of all time for this area, there was one home that remained that in no time, this area that had at one point been teeming with life and was flourishing and was thriving, it had been annihilated in an instant. That Hurricane Ike had struck with such force that it had completely leveled everything in its Path. And so the people knew life was going to be a rebuild, but in the chaos and in the devastation, there was one home that stood amongst the debris that they saw. Hurricane Ike had leveled every structure in its path, but there was one lone home standing that in the midst of this devastating storm, one home stood in defiance because this home was built different. It was built different. And I think the reality is every single one of us that are in here, we've probably encountered a storm in our life that we've felt is so strong that we've wondered, am I gonna experience the other side? Like, is that gonna happen? Anybody in here been through a storm where you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this. Uh, some of y'all are just good. You never had a storm, that's great. Let us know where you live and how you're living. But uh, for the rest of us that have actually walked through this life with some honesty, uh, all of us know what it's like to encounter a storm where you go, I don't know that I'm gonna make it through this. And for some of us, that could be a lot of different things. It might be a career challenge where you've been like, you know, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to do what I've been doing. Like I just, I've hit this midlife crisis. Is this pointless? Have I just wasted all of my good working years working towards somebody else's dream and to someone else's glory? Like, is this even worth it? I don't like my boss. I don't like my coworkers. Like something's just not working right. Maybe it's a dire diagnosis. 
where you went and you found yourself at a hospital and just a few days ago, everything just seemed fine. And now all of a sudden you're like, uh, apparently this thing is inoperable and nobody is giving us a good uh, diagnosis. Everything has just in, in a nanosecond gone from we're living our best life to is there even gonna be life that we can look back on and be like, man, things are the same as they've always been. It's all changing could be a family feud for you that you took for granted those moments where everybody comes around the dinner table and then all of a sudden it's like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna experience that again. I don't know if reconciliation's possible here. It could be a financial fear. Eggs are like seven bucks, people. I mean, you know, like it's just expensive out here and, and it's more than just like, hey, you know, groceries were a little bit expensive. It's getting to the point where you're like, I don't know if I can make ends meet. I'm upside down on some things that I really can't afford to be upside down on. Could be a marital mess. You even step into a place like this and it's like, this is supposed to be a safe place where you can uh, come and you're broken and you're hurt and all the things that you really don't wanna have to deal with outside of here, you're supposed to feel safe kind of unveiling those here. But for whatever reason, marriage is kind of one of those things that everybody's like, no, hush, hush, you're supposed to be amazing at that. Don't talk about that. And you don't know what to do with that. You're like, I, I, the person that I felt the safest with at one point, now it feels like they're my biggest enemy and I just don't know what to do. And I don't know what that's looked like in your life, but I know that we've all encountered a storm before. Uh, it's interesting, the American Psychological Association releases an annual report that measures anxiousness in America. Uh, and, and I'm gonna share some of those statistics with you, not because I desire to raise anxiousness in the room, uh, although that might be an unfortunate effect of this, but I, I really wanna level the playing field here uh, to just let everybody know how many of us actually find ourselves having a little bit of fear and anxiety and stress around some things in our life, even if we're not good at talking about it. We'll submit it to a, a, an anonymous poll with a lot of confidence, but we might not talk about it very confidently. And so, uh, and again, maybe you're one of those people where everything in life right now is rainbows and butterflies and sunshine, and you're like, I don't even know what anxiousness is. I've never experienced it. That's awesome for you. We are excited for you and we hate you. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, there are some of us that are like, hey, I, I, like I, I have dealt with that. I am dealing with that. And to have any kind of compassion is to recognize my neighbors certainly are. So it's amazing. They've come out with this poll and the American Psychological Association found that 70% of families are more concerned about their safety than ever before. 66% of people describe that they are the most anxious they've ever felt about their own health and well-being. 65% of people actually ended up saying that they are really concerned and anxious about paying their own bills and expenses. And overall, approximately 40% of people are more anxious at this time this year than they were last year. It's not quite like it was in 2020, but it's starting to trend up and it's not looking great. And I say all that to say, people are very aware and afraid of potential storms in their life. And I think many times we can be so aware and afraid and anxious of a potential storm that we forget about the stability that exists within our Savior. I think we can be so aware and anxious and afraid about a potential storm in our life that we lose sight of the stability that exists within our Savior. I do a little bit of a, uh, an internal audit of my own thoughts and the way that I talk to myself and in my conversations with other people. And very often what ends up happening is I recognize that a lot of the conversations, whether it's with me and me or me and you, are centered on what could be rather than what we can control. This is what could be. And so I'm terrified about it rather than what can I control? Now, Jesus made it clear, storms are a certainty. We're going to endure them, that you're building a home whether you know it or not, and you're building on a foundation whether you know it or not. And sometimes we can be so anxious about the inevitability of the storm that we forget to build on something with reliability that will last through the storm. And so my question for us this morning is, how do you build for a storm you know is certain? You might not know what that storm's gonna be, but you know it's gonna happen, and so what does that look like? How do you build on something that's sustainable all the way through? And what we see is that Jesus has loved talking in twos recently, that all throughout Matthew chapter seven, as we're approaching the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has told us about this tale of two gates and two paths, 
this tale of two trees. And now he's gonna talk about a lot of different twos. He says there's two builders. He says there's two homes. There's two foundations. There's two outcomes. And we're supposed to enter into this conversation recognizing that we are one of these two individuals that as we prepare and build in our life, we wanna be a people that can say, yes, this storm is unbelievably devastating. But I know that as I step back onto that peninsula of life, as everybody else is going, where is my home? How did this happen? Why is it leveled? We're able to pull back up on the church street and say, my house is still standing because it's built different. Anybody wanna build a different home? Matthew chapter seven, verse 24, began with this critical distinction here. It says, Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then you continue reading and you go to the contrasting verse in verse 26. And it says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Jesus begins the parable describing wisdom. And then he'll end this parable describing foolishness. And so it's interesting, Jesus distinguished the difference for us between wisdom and foolishness in the passage. Did you notice this? Jesus said, those who hear these words of mine and act on them will be like a wise man, and those who hear these words of mine and don't act on them will be like a foolish man. And so notice that the difference here isn't that Jesus said something different to one man than the other. No, they both... They both got the same speech. They both have the same words in front of them. It's not even that one heard and the other was struggling a little bit. It's that both of them got the same words. They both heard the difference between a wise man and a foolish man is obedience. There's one that obeyed. And I think that should bring us to a passage in James. I think many of us are probably familiar with the book of James. James is Jesus' little brother, and he steals from his older brother a lot that he ends up taking a lot of the words that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, and he puts them back into his own book in the book of James. Some of us might read James and be like, I have heard this before. You definitely have. And James says this in James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We ever heard that before? Yeah. Have we heard that before? Yeah. I'll stay here all day, people. I don't care about your lunch. I really don't. So, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If we have understanding of something that we don't end up implementing, is that useful? Not a trick question. The answer is no. If you have an understanding of something you don't end up implementing, who cares? Can you imagine if I dropped of a heart attack right here? And I wasn't quite dead, but I was getting there. I was on my way, right? I think a lot of us would be panicked by that. Some of us would probably be like, is he faking it right now? He's a little dramatic. But if it actually happened, I think some of us would be panicked by that. And we'd probably feel a whole lot of peace if somebody rose up in a room like this and was like, have no fear, I'm a doctor. We'd be like, oh, praise, thank you. We'll do something about this. And can you imagine if that individual came up here and was looking at me and they were like, man, this is so serious, this is so bad. And then they just walked away. You'd be like, what gives? Uh, What are you doing? Uh, Apparently nothing, like that's not helpful. And yet James is saying, that's what it's like to be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. You know what you could do and you don't do it. I think about it like this a lot of times. It's like reading about diets and expecting to lose weight. That's not a shot at anybody. (laughs) It's just the truth. (laughs) I read about it. What's going on with these love handles on your rear people? Like, we know what that's like. I wish it would be that way, but it's not. And here's the thing. I don't have to come up with a bunch of clever illustrations to try to make that point more clear. James expounds upon this himself. James is a phenomenal preacher. He says in verse 23 and 24, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he is. What does that mean? What James is saying is he's saying, don't look in a mirror like I do. Don't look in a mirror like Luke does, seriously. That's what James is telling us. When you read this, what James is saying is that when I look in a mirror, like the mirror in my bathroom in my home is pointless. 
If we didn't have it there, I probably wouldn't notice because I don't go to the mirror and start assessing this situation, obviously. I wear all black every day. Uh, like I don't, I don't do anything special, right? I'll see that my hair is everywhere. I probably need to shave. And I'm just like, you know what? Let's throw a hat on. Lord, bless this mess and let's get after it. Like that's the way that I live my life, okay? Is that right? Maybe not, but that's the way that it goes. And I will tell you, the way that I interact with a mirror is very different than the way that my wife interacts with a mirror, okay? Uh, the way that my wife interacts with a mirror is she can grab a strand of hair that I'm not even sure is visible to the naked eye. And she'll tuck that thing in, sing it a lullaby, just like do all the things. She's running a full diagnostic. And here's the thing, I'm not making fun of her. James is making fun of me. He's saying, you look at a mirror and don't do anything. Someone who's using a mirror properly looks at the mirror and goes, I've got some things that need attention. And what's funny is that that word looking that James uses multiple times in this passage is a word that means attentive and careful observation. And so this is not a passing glance, people. It's not. James is implying here that you look in a mirror, you look at the word of God, and as you look at it, it's looking you back, and you're supposed to go, okay, I got some things I've got to address. <laughs> There's a tension that's needed here that is going unaddressed right now. You're not supposed to look at it and be like, okay, build your house on a rock, not a sand, all right, people, how are we do Like, you're supposed to do something about it. And it's interesting, I think sometimes we find ourselves coming to the scriptures and we do so with a passing glance. Some of you knew where we were gonna be at today because we've been walking through the same thing for four months going in order. And you were like storms, rocks, sand, I know what he's gonna talk about, I've heard this before. But my question is, is the word of God just a refresher of things you already know or is it renovating your heart and your soul? See, because some of us are so familiar with it, we don't even memorize it correctly. Uh, can, I'm gonna say something that is really not like pointed at anybody, although I, I do feel the need to say it might sound like I'm stepping on toes and my intention is not necessarily to do that, though if it happens, I'm not sorry. Uh, that uh, very often what ends up happening uh, is I can, I'll be out somewhere or I'll receive an email from someone and I'm just like in the line at the grocery store and someone will be like, you know what we need to do, Luke? We need to do a collection on something real serious. We, we, what, what, what about Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Luke? What are we, we, we gonna talk about that? When are we gonna start talking about end times prophecy? Do you see where this country's going? Do you see what's going on with this? All this is bad. That's what we need to be talking about. And I'll usually just answer it with like, hey, I'll do a collection on end times prophecy if you can tell me the name of five neighbors that you have. We don't even know our neighbors. But in the age of information, we're like more information, more information. And we got a bunch of spiritually obese Christians that are walking around and we know so much and we don't do much. And it's like, I don't wanna just be someone who can recite his words and I reject his ways. I wanna walk it out. Very often we'll read things that we're very familiar with. How many of us, if I said pray for your enemies, you're like, I've heard that before, but I'd rather gossip at somebody that inconvenienced me than pray for someone who's my enemy. Like we very often find ourselves not doing what we're told. And it's interesting, the difference between a wise man and a foolish man is obedience. That's what the Lord says. They obeyed. Now listen, I realize that when we're in a storm, it can be very disorienting. That when you find yourself in the middle of a storm, it's very disorienting and you can start asking God and yourself some really dangerous questions, right? Questions that I think all of us are familiar with where you start going, Lord, I, I, I don't understand. Like what is happening right now? Why now? Why me? Will I be able to weather this storm? I don't know, Lord, what is going on right now? And in the middle of a storm, we can start to become very outcome focused rather than obedience focused. What's the outcome of this gonna be, God? I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm too concerned to even like follow you properly right now, Lord. So I, I gotta know the outcome before I'm gonna step with obedience. And an outcome focus is when we're asking questions like, how am I gonna weather this storm? But an obedience focus says, how am I gonna steward this storm? Uh, that an outcome focus is going to ask the question, Lord, why am I being troubled with this storm right now? But an obedience focus is gonna say, okay, Lord, I know that you're trusting me with this storm right now, that I'm going to step with obedience in it. I think all of us have this story where you have seen two different individuals go through the same storm with the same outcome, but very different stories all the way through it. 
because one is focused on the outcome and the other is focused on obedience. And it's a lot easier said than done, but what is our focus in the storm? Is it how ferocious the storm is or is it about how sturdy our foundation is? I believe that we can get to the other sides of some really difficult stories and we can find ourselves saying, that storm didn't destroy me, it displayed him. Let me tell you about his goodness, his faithfulness, the things that he's done. Because here's the reality, when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the outcome could be death. And that's gain for the believer. That we're victorious in Christ Jesus. It's interesting. Uh, I... I recently read this article where I I came to the realization that every single person in here can be put into one of two groups. You're either a cow or a buffalo. And um, I don't, uh, I I wouldn't just chuck that label around uh, openly. I think it'd be more something you kind of internalize. Don't, definitely don't go calling people, hey, you're a cow. Um, uh, Again, you gotta, you gotta do the diet. You can't read it. And so, uh, but it's fine. And it's not like a buffalo is much better, right? I mean, buffalo is like like a cow on CrossFit or something. But, it's, um, but if you look at it, um, it's, it's fascinating. I read this article where this guy who grew up in Colorado was talking about how he would see the different ways uh, that cows and buffaloes would interact with storms. Uh, that very often storms would roll in over the mountains from the west. And as this happened, cows and buffaloes had different reactions. Cows would react in one of two different ways. Cows would kind of see the storm coming and they would just be victims. And they'd be like, we're just gonna be sad. We're just gonna let the storm wash over us and be very sad. And then the storm would just go and roll over them and then they would just sit there for like a couple hours after the storm. Be like, you guys remember how bad that storm was? We're so sad about that storm, right? It's very sad. I don't even know if I can make milk anymore. I, I just, I'm like, that's how they are. And then there was a different group of uh, individual reactions from other cows in there that could kind of be something that was true of the whole group at different times. There would be some cows that would be filled with pride. And they'd be like, I see that storm coming. I'm gonna outrun that storm. And they would think that they're these swift creatures and they're not. And so as that was happening, they just would kind of be like, I'm outrunning this bad boy. And it would catch up to them. And they were just prolonging their pain. They were just running with the storm. And at some point they were like, this is exhausting. (laughs) Like what is going on? And then they would be like, since it's exhausting, let's be sad. Aren't you sad? Like that's what they would do. But buffaloes had a very different reaction to the storm. Buffaloes would see that a storm was coming And they knew there's nothing that we can do about this. That storm is gonna hit us. And so what we need to do is we just need to run into it, recognizing that we can push through to the other side of this, that that's what needs to happen. It's fascinating. It's very much like what we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two. It says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Recognize that obedience is more than just endurance in keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. That's an aspect of it. So it's not less than that. It's not saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even gonna look at him. No, there's, there's an aspect of this where, yes, it's important to keep your focus on Jesus. That's an aspect of obedience. But full and true and robust obedience is when you find yourself saying, I am fixated on Jesus and I'm running this race with endurance that's been set before me. That it's not just that I have an understanding and I acknowledge who he is, but that because of who he is and what he's done for me, his actions inspire my actions. That I'm gonna run this race that he's blazed the trail before me in, because what we know is that Jesus Christ, it says he's the pioneer of our faith. I love that. Don't you love that word? He's the pioneer. He said, I founded it. I'm the one that it's built on. I'm the one that blazed the trail through the ultimate storm of sin and death, that I have paved the way to redemption and restoration and your righteousness with my own blood, that he not only got to death and stayed there, but he pushed through the storm of death and sin to the other side that you and I might be here saying, and we too can find ourselves walking down that road because of what he's done. It's interesting. It's obedience that breeds that endurance, that we can endure through it. It says in verse 25, Jesus said, the rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded against that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But for the house that was on the sand, the rains fell, it says in verse 27, and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded against that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. Jesus shows us again, the difference between a wise man and a foolish man is obedience. The one who's wise does, they build on the rock. The one who is a fool doesn't, they build on the sand. Jesus is saying to us that a storm will come and it will reveal your foundation. And we know this, we see this. 
In Matthew chapter 14, there's a famous uh, situation and passage where we see Jesus walking on water and Peter joins him. We familiar with this? Do we know this? It's okay if you don't. Okay, we're here. We're good. Okay. It's great. Um, so uh, for, for those of us that have never read uh, the scriptures in here, uh, it's this story uh, where what you see happening is uh, Jesus has just fed the 5,000 miraculously. And then he says to the disciples, hey, get in, get in your boat and go across the sea to the other side. I'm gonna go pray. And as Jesus is praying, Matthew chapter 14, verse 24 tells us that the disciples end up encountering a storm. It says that their boat was battered by the wind and the waves. And Jesus approaches them on the water. And Jesus is approaching them on the water. And as this is happening, the disciples get concerned. And they say, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, no, no, no. He comforts them and he says, hey, don't fear, have courage. It is I, don't be afraid. And I wanna camp out on that idea of concern because in our culture and society, concern is a currency that you can get a lot of return for. I've noticed that we seem satisfied with this idea that the more concerned I am with a thing, the more I care about that thing. You notice that? I'm just so worried about this thing. I'm so worried about it. I'm so worried about it. And no matter how, how much you feel like you're worrying about it, it's just not enough because that's what we feel like is a display of how much care we have for that thing. And at the end of the day, what I would say is that when we find ourselves dealing with intense worries and anxieties and concerns, the intensity of those anxious worries and concerns are not always indicative of how deeply we care about a thing, but how shallow we trust God with that thing. It's how shallow we trust And we see this, that Peter's walking on water towards the Lord. And as he's doing so, his attention becomes obscured by the wind and the waves. And as a result, he starts sinking. His worries don't sustain him towards the Lord. It sinks him where he is. And for some of us, we feel like, I just gotta worry my way to this thing. I just gotta keep worrying about it. And eventually things will work out. And it's like, no, no, your worries aren't going to sustain you towards the Lord. It's gonna sink you where you stand that very often those anxious concerns that we carry about a thing in the middle of the storms that we face in life, it doesn't end up creating more clarity around our futures, just more chaos in our present. That we see with Jesus, as Jesus is walking on the water and Peter comes to join him, it's a case study of how you handle storms. Jesus and Peter walking on water truly is a case study of how you handle storms. Peter says to Jesus when he sees him walking on the water, he says, hey, hey, Lord, if that's you, then command me to walk towards you on the water. And Jesus says, come on, Peter, come out onto the water. And that's a great example of a refresher for us. I think a lot of times we remember that scripture as, wait a minute, didn't Jesus call Peter out onto the water? No, 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 Peter requested to come out onto the water in the middle of the storm with Jesus. And I say that because there's a lot of us, you're struggling and you're frustrated in the middle of a storm that you asked for and prayed for. And you're like, well, it's stormy out here. And the Lord's like, yes, it is. But here's the good news. It's like what we see with Peter, that Peter is focused on Jesus. And as he's focused on Jesus, he's stepping on surfaces that other people would most assuredly sink in. But then it says that he sees the strength of the wind. You can't even see wind. And Peter sees the strength of the wind and he finds himself in a position where he starts sinking. And I say that because the good news for us is that the antidote to finding ourselves being overcome by the storms of life is stepping with obedience towards the Lord in the storm, that we see that we step towards him even in the middle of that storm, and we will find very often that we have no need to fear the wind and the waves in the storms of this life because our Savior walks on water. He walks on water. And you notice, it's interesting, Jesus distinguishes the difference between a house that's standing and a house that's collapsing. And it's really not all that complicated, so I'm not gonna try to make it sound like it is. With both homes, they both had a storm to endure. Rain fell, rivers rose, wind pounded against the home, one good. But one had a home that was founded on the rock and the other was on the sand. And I think we can hear this and we can give ourselves a false sense of comfort, if I'm just being honest with us, because I think the way that this kind of gets talked about uh, outside of uh, like a church gathering setting, at least the way that I've talked with other people about it, is it's almost like somewhere along the line we've misconstrued this and we've said, you know, uh, I I don't need to worry about this. I'm building my life on Jesus. Jesus is the rock. Uh, But, you know, the world, that's the sand. And that ain't true. The scary thing is that both of these individuals thought they were building on the Lord. They both think they're building on the Lord. There's nothing about the world in this. Not a single thing. 
Jesus says the rock is him, but it's hearing his words and doing them. The sand is not the world. It's hearing his words and not doing them. And so for some of us, we're like, you know what? I'm good. I'm building my home on the rock. I'm building my home on Jesus. And the question isn't, am I building my life on Jesus or am I building my life on the world? The question is, are you doing the things the Lord said to do? Are we doing the things the Lord said to do? And I don't say that as like a shot to you. I mean, I wrote this and I was like, I don't like this. I don't like this, God. Are you sure about this? Because I'm pretty sure every person I've ever talked to, I think preachers have said it's the world. I'm not doing that. I'm building on you. And it's no, it's obedience is the difference here. I think it's interesting. I, I, I wrote down some questions that I've been asking myself as I got to the end of this. You know, we've been in this collection, um, I mean, just about since the year post-cross. I mean, it, but it, it, it's been a while. I mean, the week after Easter, that's April, folks. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know that I knew what I was getting into when I did that, but I did it. And so here we are. Uh, and, and one thing I've found to be absolutely true as you move throughout this is you realize if there's a theme that runs through the Sermon on the Mount, it's whatever you thought the bar was, it's higher. Jesus raises the bar. And we live in a society where that is the last thing that people wanna hear. I don't want the bar to be raised. And I asked myself these questions this week. And the questions are, do I practice the things that I profess? Do I practice them? Am I someone where people would say he knows a lot or would they say he does a lot? Am I living in accordance with the way that I would say I'm believing? Do we wanna be a people that can just recite the words of Jesus and we reject the ways of Jesus? What does that look like in our life? Matthew chapter seven, verse 28 and 29 says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. Jesus finished this masterpiece of a message and it says people were astonished. And far be it for me to put words in the Lord's mouth, but I would imagine that he would follow that up with, that's awesome. Uh, were they astonished to the point of action or they just thought it sounded cool? And honestly, I, I think you, you hear this Sermon on the Mount and it's, it's all great, right? I mean, the Lord's proclaiming that a kingdom's here, that he's the king of that kingdom. It's a kingdom of righteousness. He's elevated the standard. He's given us instruction that challenges devotion. He's calling us out, he's calling us up. There's all these, all these things I could keep going. And I think there's some of us in here, you hear about a bar being raised and you hear about how difficult all of this sounds. And the peace that I want you to have as you walk out of this place today is the Lord's not asking us to do something he didn't already do. And the good news is that he's also not asking for your performance that he's already accomplished that on your behalf. That he brings a kingdom of righteousness, not that you have to try to usher in yourself, he ushered it in. Philippians chapter two, verse eight says that Jesus Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, that he took on our sin and our shame and he did pave that way. He pioneered the way for us and he paved the way with his own blood. And so for you, I don't know what that looks like today. Maybe you've never even considered putting your faith in Jesus, but I would just tell you the bar being raised is something that he put into place himself. And it's not something that he leaves you to try to jump up and get to on your own, but that he's with you all the way through. He's not asking for perfection, he's perfecting us. It's different. He's asking for perfection from the standpoint that we're pursuing him and he's perfection. And he's sanctifying us and moving us in the right direction. But don't be discouraged by it. Be challenged by it. Be encouraged by it. Even in the middle of the storm. Lord, thank you. For the opportunity to gather together Lord, I, I just ask that you stir in the hearts of individuals that are here. Um, 
that are in the middle of a storm. If that's, if that's you, would you just raise your hand again so I can see who I'm praying for if you find yourself in the middle of a storm right now? Lord, would you move in such a way where those individuals would feel comfortable to come forward for prayer? Lord, would you meet them in the middle of that? Father, would we be a people who have our eyes focused and up on you and have the endurance to continue to step in the way that you've called us to step in the midst of that storm? Father, I'm I'm not sure if there's anyone in here who hasn't put their faith in Jesus. But if there's anyone in here who's never professed faith in Jesus, Christ, I ask that if that's you and and you wanna put your faith in Jesus this morning, that you would acknowledge that and you would do so by praying this prayer with me and saying, Father, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that you lived the perfect life that I could not and that you died the death that I deserved upon a cross, that your blood covers my sins past, present, and future, that you were taken down from that cross and you were buried in a tomb for three days, but you did not stay there. And that because you rose again and you're still alive, I can have life in your name. And praise God if that's you. And Father, for the rest of us, would you meet us in this and remind us that even as we find ourselves feeling like there is no way out of this storm, that you are more than able, that you can do it, Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we thank you.